Just as the Soviet Union was known for its social realism in art, pop art, some people said, was the capitalist equivalent, capitalist realism. What made American pop art different from the earlier, earlier British pop was pretty simple. Instead of recombining the signs of popular culture into collages that inevitably suggested the artist's choice and even the artist's vision when it came to how those signs were arranged. American pop art presented mass-produced images in a mass-produced style. There was no artist's touch. Duchamp admired pop art for just that reason, for letting images be without making them communicate or express anything. This openness to just letting things be actually expresses, when you think of it, the influence of John Cage. Duchamp recognized something else that he liked, that pop art had nothing to do with the retinal stimulation of Greenbergian modernist art. At bottom, it was a conceptual art form, this pop art, a pop art form that was concerned with the appropriation of cultural products, signs, symbols, codes, media, things that came that way. As Lawrence Alloway, the guy who coined the phrase pop art, put it in 1974, quote, Pop art deals with materials that already exist as signs, photographs, brand goods, comics, that is to say, with pre-coded materials, unquote. So while it's true that artists were once again looking around and painting what they see, what they saw wasn't reality. It was a world of signage that came that way. Another key to the period is the new status of artists. Alan Capro's 1964 quote really says it all. If the artist was in hell in 1946, now he is in business, unquote. The market had finally gotten the better of the art world. Indeed, the whole idea of the avant-garde is really at bottom about marketing, about promoting the latest fad to catch the attention of customers in a crowded marketplace. With this in mind, self-promotion for artists meant going for, say, a master's in fine arts at Yale, which would be a good place to network and which would be a good degree to have to open doors. By contrast, the Hans Hoffmann School hadn't even offered degrees. It was just about learning how to paint well. Artists enjoyed the thrill of success in an art market driven by nouveau riche collectors like Edith and Robert Skull rich from a taxicab empire. Already indications of that market had appeared in the later 1950s. In 57, when the Met bought Jackson Pollock's Autumn Rhythm of 1950 for $30,000, it was a record for a contemporary artist. Then, two years later, when de Kooning sold out a show at the Sydney Janus Gallery for $150,000. With so much money at stake, it shouldn't come as a surprise that what was arguably the most important gallerist of the time, Leo Castelli, snatched up the three artists he recognized as the leaders of the new pop art, Roy Lichtenstein, who he signed up in 1961, and Andy Warhol and James Rosenquist, who both joined the stable in 1964. Notice, they were not a movement. They didn't even know each other before they met through the gallerist who picked them up. Their work was simply responding to trends and currents of the period. Interestingly, by 1964, both Life and Time magazines had already pretty much declared pop over, or at least passe. The media, like the culture of consumers, hungered for the next new thing, the new avant-avant-garde.